Good morning, adventurers. My name is Ben, and welcome to a morning show where I sit around, drink some tea, and talk about TTRPGs. Mm. First up for TTRPG, we've got, once again, uh, the DM Thermos Mug uh, guy thing from uh, D&T. Uh, and my fiancé got it at the local game store, but you can get it online on their site. Uh, and inside of it, we have the Mystic Dragon Green Tea from uh, the Spice and Tea Exchange. Uh, apparently, it's a chain didn't realize that um yeah yeah uh, um anyway uh let's go ahead and let's dive into what we're actually talking about today because the last two episodes have gone longer than i expected uh, and i don't want to accidentally do that for this one as well uh let's go ahead and crack arc back open today it is for you the guides of the world and some of the some player stuff as well but mostly the guides uh we are talking about what it takes to actually run this game the things that you need to know uh to actually make this game happen um I've pulled out three things that are really, in my mind, sort of the biggest things that you need to know. Uh, some of them are going to sound a little familiar, so let's go ahead and let's just crack it on open uh, and get to talking about it. Uh, the first thing, uh, again, it's going to sound kind of similar to day two of this week for this one. We're going to be talking about uh, threshold numbers, TNs, um, and really talking about actually uh, setting it a little bit more the nitty gritty of it. Uh, I've talked about it here and there as we go, um, but. Let's go ahead and let's start from scratch on it, really. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this game is kind of like golf in that you want to hit below the threshold number that is being set uh, for you. So the higher the TN goes, the better. Uh, as I mentioned on, uh, I think it was Tuesday, maybe it was Monday, uh, this game actually sets up your threshold numbers for you a little bit. It lets the players take some of that work. Uh, it does not require you to choose a uh, choose a number on a scale of 1 to 30 like some uh, games might um, in order to actually determine the difficulty of what you are doing um, instead what this does it is the uh, the threshold number ends up being the sum of the skill rank the approach score uh, and then any modifier that gets added to it so uh, if somebody is making a uh, skill check in which they have a plus two uh, that TA gets set to 2. If they are approaching it in a creative way, let's say, and they have a plus 2 in uh, creative approach, that becomes a plus 4, uh, or their TN becomes 4 total. Um, so, from there, if it is just a regular difficulty sort of check, you don't add anything as the guide, uh, and you go ahead and you just have them roll from there, and they try and hit a 4 or lower. Um, however, you can add uh, difficulty modifiers ranging from plus 1 to minus 3. Uh, plus one being easy, again, because you are uh, trying to raise the TN uh, to make things easier, or the players are trying to raise the TN to make things easier. Plus one is an easy uh, thing, so if that same plus, or if that same four TN thing is pretty easy, you go ahead and you add a plus one to it, so it becomes a five instead. Makes it very likely that they're going to succeed on that roll. Uh, zero, nothing, is just normal difficulty. It's not particularly overly difficult. Uh, but it's not necessarily super easy either, so there is no modifier to it. That 4 stays a 4. A minus 1 is very difficult. Uh, that is something where uh, you don't really have the, or they don't really have the right tools, they don't really have the right preparation, that kind of thing. Um, that 4 then becomes a 3. They now have to hit below a 3 in order to succeed. Uh, a minus 2 is incredibly difficult. Uh, actively uh, courting risk by doing what they're doing, uh, specific resistances against what they're trying to do, uh, stuff like that gets you a minus two, which means that that four then becomes a two. Uh, and a minus three is almost impossibly difficult. Uh, the example they keep using in this book is asking a dragon on a date, which I think is funny uh, and kind of appropriate based on the meme culture on the internet surrounding that general idea. Uh, so that four drops down to a one. Uh, and again, I cannot emphasize this enough. If you meet the TN, you either succeed with a consequence or fail with an opportunity. There, you are not getting off scot-free if you hit a one on that one. Uh, so keep that in mind uh, when you are applying difficulty and when uh, players are doing something. Now, there is a little something that uh, other players can do to try and change the TN. Uh, that is assisting. Um, We'll talk shortly about uh, the way to do that in uh, the, you know, run of combat and stuff like that. But uh, assisting uh, allows uh, 
other characters who have certain levels of bond uh, with other characters uh, to actually change the TN of a uh, specific check. So uh, if there is no major bond between uh, a pair of characters, there is nothing really that, that one can do to assist. If there is one level of major bond between them, if the assisting character has uh, some modifier in the relevant skill, they can assist and add their levels of major bond to the TN. So that four, if they get help from a buddy who they have a uh, one level of major bond with, that four then jumps to a five before uh, the uh, guide's difficulty class modifier is added to it. Um, assuming that that friend has uh, some kind of modifier in that actual relevant skill. Uh, so it's a little convoluted, but it does make sense, I promise. Uh, <laughs> So you roll, uh, and then you see what you get. Uh, the only other thing to note about TNs here is that you can actually upgrade the outcome uh, when it is situationally appropriate. Uh, you, can you can change a tied roll, so rolling a four on a TN4, uh, to a pure success or a failed roll um, to a tied roll, basically, if, if you are willing to sacrifice three blood or three guts um you not someone else just you uh so that is that's a lot to sacrifice so you have to be really careful about that one but it is it is something that you have the ability to do uh if you are willing to uh, and need that skill check to go off without as much of a hitch um so keep that in mind when you are playing as well um we are going to jump uh, again to something that is probably going to seem pretty familiar to uh, you if you listen to or watch Tuesday. We're going to go ahead and we're going to talk about the Doomsday Clock. Um, I raced through it before. We're going to break it down a little bit more. Uh, as I mentioned on Tuesday, there are three components to the Doomsday Clock. There are moments, there are omens, and there is the Doom at the end of it all. The Doom is the big, bad, final thing uh, that is coming at the end of it. It doesn't have much relevance to the actual clock. Uh, but it is important to actually have ready in your mind and how it is being affected by what is going on. Omens, working backwards, omens are uh, the plot points that get you to the doom at the end of the game. Uh, omens are also the thing that will speed up the game. Uh, it, it is kind of like uh, the, it is the built-in timer on top of the timer. Um, so if you think about it uh, in a very sort of like traditional fantasy uh, thing, if a cult is trying to summon a god uh, and they have three different things going on, if they are um, making sacrifices to said god to bring them into being, if they are excavating for artifacts to bring uh, them into being, and if they are preaching about them out and around in order to try and build the sphere of influence, those three things could be the omens uh, that you are uh, or that the players are actively trying to fight against. So, uh, keep those three in your mind. We'll come back to them in a second. Jumping back to moments. Moments are basically uh, the mile markers on your Doomsday Clock. Um, again, uh, there is a table on page 32 of the book here, right here, uh, that tells you how uh, many you should actually have and how often the clock should advance. But uh, at the end of each predetermined time period of real time, uh, you go ahead, one of uh, the moments disappears automatically, and then you go ahead and you roll for the number of omens that still remain in the game uh, and advance at that many moments total. Um, this is a really, really cool uh, concept. I like it a lot, but uh, let's go ahead and let's uh, crack it open just a little bit more here. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, if you have uh, your... Uh, doomsday clock running let's say the timer is set for one hour uh, because you are planning on playing two to three sessions of this game uh, again it can be way shorter if uh, your players don't get things done particularly quickly but we'll say doomsday clock goes off every hour uh, doomsday clock goes off uh, and the number of remaining omens are also rolled for at that point if in our earlier example your players are currently actively trying to clear out the mine that these cultists are using to excavate artifacts for uh, this evil god. It does not matter because they have not finished yet. Um, you could maybe be a little bit more generous if you wanted to, but in my mind, they have not finished that yet. It means the 
threat is still present and real, which means you are still rolling for that omen, regardless of how close to actually finishing they are. If they haven't actually put the button on the end of it, they have not finished up yet. So um, if we'll call it, you have 12 of uh, these omens on this doomsday clock, or of these moments on this doomsday clock, that hour hits, you knock one off, 11. You then take your 3d6, you roll them. Um, anything that rolls a five or six on those, loses one more moment. So let's say we roll, uh, they're in the middle of this final thing and they're so close, but they haven't quite finished it yet. We roll those 3d6 and we get a five and a six uh, as well as a two or something. The two doesn't matter. The five and six, we also then mark off two more moments, even though in three minutes of real time, they're going to finish up that one omen and then it goes away. In that situation, we have lost a total of three of our 12 moments uh, early on. So our timer starts again at the end of that next hour they have made some decent progress towards uh sort of like curbing the amount of uh word spreading that these people are doing but they haven't actually quite gotten there yet so uh we go ahead and we knock off a moment for uh the hour that has gone past and then we go ahead and we roll 2d6 because they have finished up in the mine roll those 2d6 uh three and a four we're good that's it so uh the the doom marches ever onward because no matter what, it will arrive at the end of that timeline and that timeline advances with the uh, uh, progression of real time as well. So even if there are not more moments or more omens added in uh, for them to actually interact with, it will eventually get here one way or another. It just gives them a little bit more time to prep and that is very much important. Um, the third and final thing that I wanna talk about here is conflict everybody's favorite conflict always has to fall into uh this section here uh conflict 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 uh it is actually uh set up in this game in kind of an interesting way i think so um conflict in arc how does it work how does it go uh conflicts are quote unique situations where characters are at odds danger is imminent and victory is on the line um so uh, conflict, as in many games, is set up in a series of rounds. Each round, uh, each individual will get a turn. Um, and the way that it is set up, there's no initiative order or anything like that. Uh, it is set up based on the action you want to take. But player actions resolve, and then uh, enemy actions resolve. With the exception of the first round, if the enemies have taken you by surprise, then the enemy actions resolve, then the player actions resolve, and then we get back into a normal sort of cycle there. So... The actions you can take uh, are as follows. Stand your ground, harm others, non-harmful actions, use a spell or technique, and move far. Those are the five actions you are able to take. Those five actions happen in that order in every single uh, round. So during your turn, you can do one of uh, those actions. Uh, as well as move a little bit. Uh, this game is set up in heights, which basically is five to six feet uh one to two meters which i know is not the same as five to six feet i want to be clear on that one <laughs> i think it's actually 1.5 to two meters which is also not five to six feet but basically if you're doing things on a standard battle mat that you have for dungeons and dragons or something like that it's two squares you can move two squares up to two squares in any direction for free on your actual turn based on the action you're going to take um, if you want to go further than that you have to take the move far action which is the last thing that happens in a round of combat um, so, if you choose to stand your ground, uh, anyone attacking you or allies within a 10 foot to height radius, uh, receive a minus one to their attacks TN, and you might gain a minor level of bond depending on the actual context of everything that's going on, um, up to the first major level of bond. Uh, harm others. Uh, is your second action option. Uh, attack enemy with a relevant skill check. Physique or weaponry to harm blood. Insight or impose to harm guts. Uh, difficulty modi modifiers might apply uh, or be stacked uh, in certain ways. Um, for example, it is more difficult to use weaponry to attack if you are not actually wielding a weapon. Um, however, uh, you might in a wonderful segue there, you might have a weapon or some defense items. That also adjusts the TN. Uh, defense items reduce the attacks TN by their bonus. A plus two armor reduces the TN by two. Uh, and then a plus two sword will increase the TN by two. 
Um, no, it does not. Sorry, sorry. I get this one mixed up every time I uh, think about it. Damage dealt with a plus two weapon does not adjust the TN, uh, but it adjusts the damage dealt. So, uh, important note here, the damage dealt is equal to the TN plus any relevant modifiers. So, uh, if you go ahead and you hit somebody with a plus two sword and you have rolled weaponry and the TN is four uh, and you roll three, uh, great, congratulations, you've hit them. Uh, they then take four plus that two from the sword's damage uh, for a total of six blood damage. Um, you can do a lot of damage really fast, but the idea is that Things that are harder to hit, you are not going to be able to hit as well. And things that are easier to hit, you are going to be able to smack into the ground forever. So if the TN to hit something is like 5, you are you are dealing serious damage every single time. So if you are planning on playing a character that is uh, on the front lines, uh, ready to attack every single time, having physique or weapon rate might be a really good thing for you because your TN will be higher every time, therefore you will hit more often, and you will deal more damage. Uh, so definitely important things there uh non-harmful actions you could take uh creating an advantage uh giving which gives a bonus to the tn and subsequent uh skill checks by allies uh you can kind of like it basically it is a non-aggressive action exactly as it said uh you can do something to try and distract try and set somebody else up uh anything like that that will maybe adjust the tn for another party member uh as you go forward uh, it can be an interesting sort of way to go about uh, adjusting the battlefield to fit the way that you actually want it to be. You can also assist someone, um, which is we talked about uh, when we talked about setting TNs. Uh, you can try and help somebody out with something that they are trying to do. Uh, four, performing a spell or technique at this point. Uh, so again, you are fourth in the order at this point here. Um, you perform a spell or technique every time you're attacked uh, before... Uh, your actual turn hits, you have to roll a d6 roll to maintain concentration. It starts at 6 and it drops by 1 with each subsequent hit. Um, it says hit in here. It doesn't mean hit because the last line of this is every attack, even if it misses, incurs this roll. So, uh, if you are concentrating quote unquote, on getting ready to cast a spell and somebody takes a swing at you but they miss, you roll a d6. If you roll uh, under tn6, you maintain that uh, spell. The next time they swing at you again, you roll again. If you roll under TN5, you maintain that, and so on and so forth. Um, I think I said it a little bit weird earlier. Uh, basically, as you go through this, uh, you decide where you're going to be in the turn order, and then they bounce back and forth between players and monsters for each one of those things, but all the players go, and then all the monsters go. So everybody who is standing their ground goes on the player side and then all the monsters who stand on the ground go and then all the players who uh harm others go and then all the monsters harm us it back and forth like that that is what i meant earlier i'm realizing that that didn't make a whole lot of sense earlier when i said it um so assuming you successfully make it to this point your uh skill or, or your spell or technique goes off congratulations you made it um then the last thing here is to move far if a hero isn't being attacked or targeted uh, you may move up to five more heights, so five more squares, uh, if you are using a traditional battle mat. Otherwise, if you are being attacked or targeted, you must succeed on a skill check, maybe acrobatics or coordination, to move. Alternatively, you can opt to move without it, but all enemies within two heights, ten feet-ish, of you can roll to attack as long or as you escape their grasp. So, be careful, <laughs> but uh, you might incur basically attacks of opportunity to do that. Um, so, that is combat in uh, ARC. That is, uh, the I in my mind, the biggest things you need to know about running the game. Um, there are some smaller things like breasts and uh, that sort of thing, but those are just sort of like random things that happen. Um, and you can cover those in uh, extra rules, extra little bits of time. Uh, maybe I'll cover them tomorrow. We'll see. Um, so... That is everything with that. This video is, or this episode has gone on longer than I expected to once again. Um, so that is everything I have to talk to you guys about today. Thank you so, for, so very much for making me part of your morning routine. I really do appreciate it. And thank you in particular to my subscribers. You guys are the ones that make this show possible. If you're interested in supporting the show, just subscribe either on YouTube or on the podcasting platform that you listen on. It is the best way to support the show. So that is everything I have for you guys. So with all that said, everybody, don't forget, drink tea. 
play TTRPGs and keep on rolling.